It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to Jill on Money. We are delighted that you're joining us. Happy spring. You've sprung ahead. You're ready to spring. Little cleaning up of your financial life. We'd love to help you out. This is the program we take the mystery out of your money. And I am Jill Schlesinger. And I am a certified financial planner. I'm the senior CFP board ambassador. And Mark is very close to getting his... Are you in your last module now of retirement? Oh, one more module at this to get his CFP coursework done. Whether you sit for the exam or not, you're going to sit. Yeah, you should just do it. He's going to sit for the exam. And uh, we'll we'll have to see how he does. I mean, there's only two grades, man. Pass, fail. You don't get an actual number. We are so happy you're joining us. And uh, we have lots of fun stuff. We've got this brand new website that Mark has created with the Mad Russian. And it looks beautiful. Um, despite what my former designer sent me a an email and and basically wanted to know what I'd done to her beautiful site and did I really intend for it to look that way. My favorite part of that email, Mark, was like the side shot. Like, is this your temporary site? What do you go? <laughs> no, this is the site. <laughs> so I like the new site. I d- have lost some of my design flourishes. It is true. But I think it's easy and it's clean. She kind of slapped down like, oh, this is a simple Squarespace site. I'm like, well, why should it be more complicated than that? But what's funny about it is really, it's sort of like, I feel like the website is a reflection of what I think about investing. Like it, there can be lots of flourishes. There can be lots of bells and whistles. But in the end, just having a boring investment that is just clicking along like, I own four different index funds in, you know, in different asset classes, and it's pretty boring, but it works. You know, that kind of thing. That's really why I'm going to I think that the the website is the the like the the metaphor for what I think investing should be clean, simple, no muss, no fuss. Less is more, says Mark, the best executive producer ever in the history of mankind. Uh, All right. So lots of ways to get in touch with us. The easiest is to send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. First up, we've got Tom from Oakland on the line. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Well, hey, thanks for taking my call. I'm a big big fan of the show. I really appreciate it. Excellent. What can I do? Uh, I am looking for some advice or some suggestion or help on um, how much importance or value I should be putting on um, uh, my my current company's defined pension plan. Mm. So I have been at my current employer about five years, and um, occasionally uh, job offers will show up. And as I evaluate them or look at them, they usually always have more salary, but, you know, that there's very few jobs still offering a pension. Yeah. And so, um, so really sort of that question of money now versus money later yeah and wonder wondering how much importance i should put on that versus you know going to something that might offer more salary up front yeah i get that um you know look the the part of this that's tricky is that it is a pension today that may go away in the future right they they can always say you've got a pension oh and we're converting it to a cash balance plan we no longer have a pension so let me ask you uh some couple a couple of questions for for right now, how much are you earning in the current job? So currently, between salary and bonus, I'm just about just under two hundred thousand. All right, I'm going to call it two hundred. So, and and tell me about the pension. Do they contribute to this pension plan, or do you, or is it some combination? It's just them. Just them. Do you know how much they yep. put away? Well, it's a it's based around um, this really crazy formula of. Um, you know, average uh, salary times um, uh, a number, you know, years of service or how, or how long I've been there. Mm-hmm. So I know that if I were to leave now, um, I get just about nine hundred dollars a month at sixty-five. Okay. And uh, I'm only forty, so five years of service gets you that. That's pretty and good. Then, and then if I'm there for another, say, ten years, that goes to closer to three thousand a month. Wow. Okay, and um, and this is a big company that I may have heard of potentially. 
Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. So not going broke, they're funding it. You know, sometimes we worry about pensions of companies and they just, you know, if the company goes bust, then the pension is unfunded and that's a problem. So if you were going to get a new job, let's talk about what the jump in salary might mean. How? So if you were at 200-ish now, what would it, what would it go to in order uh, to compensate for the loss of the pension? What, what's the higher salary? Well, one that I recently just sort of evaluated had the between salary and bonus going closer to 230. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them are in that, you know, sort of ballpark. So okay. I'm going to make it easy for yeah. you. You ready? Sure. Do you hate your yeah. job or do you like your job? Oh, I'm fine. I, do you, yeah, I mean, I, I like I, <laughs> I like my job. Okay. Um, there's no way you should drum, jump for 30 grand. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to make it much harder on me. I thought you were going to say, like, okay, well, I go from 200 to 350. That's what I thought you were going to say, because then it starts to get harder. Let's be Got clear. It. When you're 65 years old, to generate $3,000 a month, or just think about what what is $3,000 a month. Today, if you wanted to generate $3,000 a month, I need you to save a million bucks, about. So you need to make so much more than your 200 so that you can accumulate that money that will generate the money that the pension is going to generate. So even for you right now, even just to get, you know, the 900 a month, I still need you to save a bunch of money in a retirement account or outside of a retirement account. And the extra 30 grand is not going to cut it. So for today... Unless you're going to make a much bigger jump, and I would imagine that that jump means that you actually have to have a three in front of it, uh, stay where you are. Because uh, to have that bonus is uh, to ha- sorry, not the bonus. To have the pension is a terrific benefit and very hard to match. Got it. Make sense? That's great. All right, don't piss off anyone at work because I need you to keep that job. <laughs> now that we've decided it's a good one. All right. Good luck. Thanks so much for calling. Thank you. I want a pension. Mark, did you miss the potential for a pen- t- pension? Shh, probably by, yeah. I thought I thought you had you were you might have gotten a little bit of it. I'm not sure. Oh, I can't hear you now. What just happened? Oh, there it is. My my, yeah. How much? Then why don't you bring me coffee every single time we come in here? I'm totally kidding. That's a good. That's a good number. It's something. That's, I guess, what my point is with a lot of these considerations. It is amazing to have guaranteed income. And in my mind, of those two words, the more important one is guaranteed. So as you start thinking about pensions, teachers out there, municipal employees, you feel like you're underpaid. Well, you know, you're getting part of your pay today, but a lot of it in the future. So don't complain too much until you run the numbers and you see... What could I earn in the private sector without this job that offer, offers a pension? Do what Tom did. Look at two, these two different opportunities and say what works. And if you need help, let us know. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. When we return, we're going to take more of your calls. It's Jill on Money. Go sign up for our newsletter right now. Go to JillOnMoney.com and you'll get a newsletter from Mark every Friday. All right, we'll be right back. Eight five five four one one Jill. That's the number to call to have your financial questions answered. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we want to hear from you. Just give us a holler. So easy. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. See? I just made it so easy. Okay, uh, let's get to uh, next caller. It is Matthew. Where did you say Matthew is from? Oh, right. Matthew is from Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. Matthew, I'm coming to visit you. I'm going to try. A friend of mine works for uh, a Viacom, one of the Viacom channels, and invited me to an award show. What's that all about? I have to go check that out. It would be a total fish out of water thing. I think I'd have to do Rent the Runway and get something cool to wear because I don't have anything cool. 
But uh, June in L.A., what can I expect, Matthew? June in L.A., you can expect it to be overcast and probably anywhere from like 80 to 100 degrees. Stop it. That's too hot. I I don't tell me about it. Oh, my God. Jeez. (laughs) All right. What can I do for you, sir? What's happening? Well, let me first say I'm a huge fan of yours. I listen to your radio show, listen to your podcast, both calls a week. Um, you just creating, you just keep creating content, and I will listen to it. Oh, so. thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yes. I appreciate it. Um, well, here's my deal. You know, I listen to your show all the time, and one of the things, you know, I get a little envious when people say, oh, I'm 45 years old, and I have $2 million saved, and it kind of makes me want to go back in a time machine and, you know, open up an IRA at, like, 18. I know, right? Um, totally. Yeah, frustrating. Uh, I came to the savings game a little late, and I'm just concerned that I'm not on the right track for retirement. Okay. Well, tell me about yourself. Uh, 49 years old, single. Um, I'm a freelance TV producer. Ah. Yeah. And I've been fortunate to be at the same company now for the past six years, and where I earn about $160,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, but my job is sadly coming to an end in a few weeks. So I know this year I'll probably, you know, go back to freelancing and make significantly less. Like how much less do you figure? If you go from 160, what do you think it'll go to? Uh, maybe, you know, 120, maybe 130. I'm not really sure to be honest. Okay. That's okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Before I had this job, I was calling in, you know, 90 a year, 90 to 100. So it was a huge jump. Okay. And um, when you're a freelancer, you just have your own retirement account. How have you handled that? Well, for this job, I've had a retirement account. Um, they offer like a 401k. Mm-hmm. So I've had that for the past uh, past five years, I think it was. But they don't match. And because I'm a high high income employee, I can only contribute at something like 4.4%. Oh, of good my salary. God. That's such a yeah. pain. Okay. Um. But I have an. I, I'll give you all my financials too. Though um, I have uh, thirty thousand thirty thousand dollars in this four hundred one k at work. I have one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the traditional IRA with Fidelity. Um, I have about two hundred and five thousand dollars in a brokerage account, mm-hmm. and then another seventy, probably about seventy five thousand dollars in like a online savings account. Okay, that's great. And so that savings account is basically kind of like I'm freelance, I'm scared, and so you built it up to probably more money than you need just because of your particular circumstances? Exactly. Okay. Um, Okay, tell me about, uh, are you a renter or an owner? A renter. How much do you pay in rent? Uh, $14.95. Wow, that's cheap. I know, right? That's good. No reason to buy. Yeah, since everything around here is going for 3000 a month or something like that. Huh, okay. Yeah, great. So tell me a little bit about um, what, I mean, you've got this free cash flow. It's come in. But now on 120, let's say it's 120 a year, okay? Right. Presume that, and you can still pay your bills, right? Because how much right. How much beyond the, let's, you know, you're 1500 for rent. What else do you need to live on? I spend maybe tops like, 3500 a month. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't have a car payment. I don't have credit card debt. So, yeah, I don't spend a lot. Okay. So when you start looking at your next phase, uh, right. I think considering that you already have this nice nest egg, let's not – I wouldn't put more money into that. What I would probably do at this point is now you're going to be self-employed, Okay. Now it's time for you to actually open up a retirement account where you can really put a bunch of money away. Right. Um, you know, and it, you turn, do you turn 50 this year? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. That was a very personal question, and I apologize. There's a method <laughs> hey, that wasn't no. just being, like, annoying because when you think about this, if you had your own, you can open up what's called a uni 401k. You can basically establish your own 401k. You said you have a Fidelity account already. Right. You can go to Fidelity. You can say, I'm going to open up an, when you get your new gig and you really understand what you're, what you're going to make. But presuming, again, you make that 120000 
you can open up a 401k just for yourself. You can't have employees, just for yourself. And you can put away $18,500 this year. Plus, if your cash flow is really good and it allows it, an additional 6000 because you will be turning 50 in this year. So when you say to me, what can I do to, like, you know, crank it up and, you know, instead of going back in the time machine, right. if you could take of your one hundred twenty grand, if you could take $24,500 off the top and put it into an, an, a uni 401k, a self-employed 401k, that is an amazing way to get cranking. It's presuming, and again, for everyone listening, the difference for, for in Matthew's case is that he's living beneath his means. So even if we did that, we first of all, it would come out pre-tax, so that's good. You'll, your taxable income will be reduced. You're going to be right. an incredibly you know, affordable tax bracket, and even with the annoyingly high California state income tax, <laughs> you will still be in uh, the 24% tax bracket. That will be the highest tax bracket for you. So I think that that's what I would say. If you were going to be looking to really get going and kind of make up some ground, that's the way to do it. And if you are then, you know, what I would also advise you is that if you're in the situation where you're negotiating with a company and, you know, it's about a freelance job, don't be afraid to be self-employed. In your case, it actually, unless they've got a great 401k plan, it may be better to have your own. Right. So that's yeah, what I would. That's the thing. I've been just contributing to this 401k plan at work, which is great, but it's just, I'm not getting a match. It's only like 4.4%. It's just, you know, it's yeah. been nice, but it's not been ideal. Exactly. So I think you're going to take this into your own hands and, um, and then you can work with Fidelity on it. If there's any problem, call me back. And uh, keep your allocation kind of boring but good, as I like to call that. Boring but good is, you know, index funds, a little stocks, a little bonds, maybe a little real estate, tiny bit of commodities, and boom, you're done. Nothing more than that. Don't make yourself crazy. I will not. I All promise. Right. You promise? Pinky swear with me. Pinky swear. All right. I love it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for calling. I wish you the very best of luck. I think you're on your way. Thanks, Joe. All right. That is good. That is some good... That is some good stuff there. This guy is good. I have. I think he's ready to rock and roll. You know where he listens to us, Mark? YouTube. How about that? I, I made fun of Mark because I'm like, eh, who's going to listen to us on YouTube? Meanwhile, people do. Well, he certainly did. And, and there are some people that are actually, you know, subscribing. So, <sighs> so great. Mark, you're the best. You really are. You're the bestest. Okay. Uh, if you have a financial question, Mark will field it. And it, it's very easy to get in touch with us. All you have to do is go to jillonmoney.com. That is our website. And there's a contact us little button. If you want to talk to us live, you can always send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. If you listen to us on YouTube, just do that too. YouTube. Who knew? All right. When we return, more of your calls. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. Yes, we're taking the mystery out of your financial life. You think I should stand up and do this? My neck is killing me. My back is killing me. I'm falling apart, Mark. It is age. Funny, Mark just says to me, it's age. My trainer said the same thing. I said, oh, you know, my hip hurts a little bit. He goes, you know why? I said, why? He said, because you're old. Ugh. It's true, though. A lot of miles on this model, my friends. If you've got a financial question, I'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Someone wrote in, wants to know whether it makes sense to purchase an insurance hybrid. And here's the question. Um, our financial planner 
has suggested that we purchase an insurance hybrid for me and for my husband, $155,000 into each. We are financially responsive. I expect to have a retirement savings mutual fund. Oh, wait, I think she means responsible. We are financially responsible. They expect to have retirement savings in excess of $3 million bucks when they retire. They're 55 and 60 years old right now. No health issues. Would not make sense to pay for help. So I think this is so these hybrid policies are essentially a way to get kind of a backdoor um, long term care. So um, it's a way of buying an insurance policy that can be used for long term care issues. Um, and so that she writes, our, our planner's a nice guy. He's done good. He's done a good job in giving us advice in the past, but I'm sure he's making money on us. I fear is one option that this is basically a way for him to get additional money for himself. Um, you probably don't need this. You probably don't need insurance at all. Um, you could probably self-insure for your long-term care, but that's just my two cents, especially with $3 million at retirement. I don't see that you really need this. You might, might was, I don't know if you want to like take that money out of your total nest egg and you lose the liquidity. I don't know. I don't think it's going to, I don't think you'd probably need it. Uh, and one thing to ask that financial planner is how much does he make if you buy this? Another question to ask is whether this financial planner say, hey, what are my alternatives to this? If we don't do this, what else should we think about? And then ask them to tell you why this is the why this is the advice that's in your best interest. You may want to find out whether this person is a fiduciary, whether they do have to put he has to put or she has to put your uh, oh nice guy if whether he has to put your best interest first. If that's the case, I'd be interested to hear what his rationale is. Okay, give that a try. Here's another uh, email from a listener who hears us on WCCO 8.30 a.m. out of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, okay. I hope you can give me and my wife a few pointers on when and how to best talk to our two grown children about our estate. We're both retired. I'm 62 and a half. My wife just turned 64. I worked 37 years at a big company. I won't mention it. My wife was uh, the primary caretaker. Um, Our son is 34. He's a major in the Air Force. He flies B-52s. That's kind of cool. Daughter's almost 33, a middle school math teacher. Both are married. Our son has three children. Our daughter has two children. We have approximately $2.2 million in a diversified portfolio. We've worked very closely with a CFP for the last 10 plus years. We own a home um, uh, in Wisconsin. Another lake home about uh huh together. They got so they got homes worth six hundred eighty grand. They've got a good long term care policy that they started about nine years ago. They've got three insurance policies. I don't know why you need three. Six hundred grand. We plan to pass that along to our children when we die. Got a pension, thirty nine hundred bucks a month. Stocks that yield monthly dividend, thirteen hundred. No debt. Uh, revocable trust in place since the year two thousand. Everything's in the trust. We haven't said much to our children or their spouses up to this point. We are close to all of them, so no major issues in talking to them. The question is, when's the right time and how do you go about it? Could them thinking we have a bunch of money affect them and how they approach their lifestyles? I think they're doing okay financially on their own and would handle this type of information in a positive manner. My wife and I were hoping to give, pass along a significant amount of money to each of our five grandchildren, but that would be when they are either graduating from high school or college. Any suggestions would be much appreciated. I think that there is no time like the presence. I think that you can sit them down and say, you know, I just want to let you know that we've got, um, you know, we're going to tell you the details of some of our, our of our plans. You tell who's whoever is the, be, the um, trustee of the trust the executor of the will, you can go over your health care issues, what you hope you, to gain, you know, in terms of their participation in this. And like, this is what our wishes are. I do think you do all of that. It does not sound to me like either of these kids, a teacher or a guy who's flying B-52s. It doesn't sound like this is going to go to their heads. 
It doesn't sound like they're going to just stop doing what they're doing. First of all, you could live for 30 years and spend a lot of this money down. And you could say that to them. You know, we want to tell you what's going on so you understand this. Um, If you intend to maybe pay for their kids' college education, I would tell them that. Right? I mean, I think that that's something that could really help alleviate some concern on their on their end. But I think that you should have a conversation first with each other and your estate attorney and then just sit down with the kids and say, next time, everything's cool. We've taken care of this. This is where all the documents are. And you really have just a general conversation. And then you say, you know, we've got a bunch of money. You're probably going to inherit it. This is what we hope to do. This is how it's going to go. But obviously, if we get sick or something bad happens or we live really, really long, you might not get anything except that insurance. But you'll get that. And that's it. And I don't think you should be nonchalant about it. You've worked your butts off to do all this. But I do think that the sooner you have conversations like these, the better it is. And as I said, from what you're describing in this email, it does not sound like this is going to screw up the kids. It's one thing to say, tell an 18 year old this information, which I wouldn't do, but it's another thing. They're grown. They've got families. It might actually take some stress off of them, which would be kind of a nice thing also, right? Thank you so much. It's a great issue and everyone should be having these conversations, whether with your adult children or your aging parents. You're listening to Jill on Money. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's our email address. Follow us on Twitter at Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. Do you have a question for us? We'd love to help you out. But you've got to talk to us. Send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. Danny is ready to build a family home in Florida. Uh, Just, he got a vacant lot, 115 grand. And he's got a whole bunch of money he's got to pay in construction and all this, that, and the other thing. And lots of different numbers here. But just know that, uh, you know, looks like you're going to have a a pretty nice house. Um, He's got a condo now. They're living in it. uh, And it's... Looks to me like uh, living expenses are about a hundred grand a year. No debt other than the mortgage. He grossed about uh, three hundred eighty-five grand. Let's uh, so say he takes a salary. Blah blah blah. Looks to me like he's making a good chunk of money. So he says. Did he say how old he was? Hold on a second. I don't think he did. Did he say how old he was, Mark? I don't see that. Anyway, looks like he's got his numbers down here. Anyway, he's got the income to build a home and get a mortgage for the new house uh, as long as uh, he makes just half of what he's making now. So he's good with that. He's got a bunch of money in liquid assets, about 175 grand, about another 130 grand in retirement assets. Um, So here's the question. Would you recommend that I rent our condo that we're living in now and get a little positive cash flow, or would you sell it and invest the money, um, the the hundred grand or so from the sale of the house, or furnish my house with it? If I rented the condo, um, I think that you know he basically can save a he he would be able to uh, he would be able to use the money from the rent to pay some money out in the expenses. Here's my thought about this. I I am I don't think you should rent the condo. I think you should sell the condo, take the money and use it for the house and be done with it. The because you what you write here is funny. You said it's safe to say the condo will appreciate 5% a year. Why? Why is it safe to say that? I don't think it's safe to say that. Didn't we learn our lesson already? I would simply what I would do is I would 
I, I don't, unless you're like really into renting and being a landlord, I would sell the condo. I would um, essentially use that money to help finance this new home. That's it. And and I really wouldn't get too cute here. You know you've got a good deal. You've got a good income. You take risk. You're a small, you know, you've got an S-corp. Don't, don't ask for trouble. Use that money. Use it for the new home. Don't look back. That's my that's my two cents. Again, I'm a simple gal. You want to, You think you can be a landlord and you can get a little cash flow out of it, a couple hundred dollars a month? Fine. I'm not into that. I'd sell it, take the money, and use it. Okay, Kyle writes, I receive a portion of my ex-husband's retirement every month, 706. Oh, I'm sorry, Kylie. Kyle, you idiot I am. Kylie receives a portion of her ex-husband's retirement every month, 760 bucks. It goes to a checking account. I'm not retired yet. Um, I just turned 64. He's 77. I have a retirement plan from work. I'm contributing a bunch of money, 16% every two weeks, paying tax on the money I receive for him. Yes, you are, because it's alimony, and alimony is taxable. Should I continue to accumulate the money in account so I have money if something should happen and I need it, or should I put it someplace else? There's $30,000 in there right now. I do have to dip into it occasionally. Ah, yeah, keep it safe. Don't, again, there's a theme of of this segment, this segment of the show, which is uh, let's not get too cute. Let's not get too cute in terms of what you're doing. Keep it simple. So, yeah, just put it into A nice, boring checking account, especially if you are using that. Okay? That's a good question. Very good question. Okay. Uh, You are listening to Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, just give us a shout. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, have you checked out our podcast, Better Off? Go to the website and you can find out how to get involved in that whole thing. JillOnMoney.com. If you want to just uh, go subscribe to it, go to Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. My favorite podcast is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. My second favorite podcast, um, well, you're putting me on the spot. I, I You know what? I, I really love Ezra Klein's show. I think he's amazing. I love him, and I love his other podcast, The Weeds. These are very, like, super wonky podcasts, so I love that. What about you, Mark? And you see, he asked me the question, and I stumped you. He likes Bill Simmons. You like the whole sports thing. I'm not that interested. Um, I also, let me do a, let's see what other pl- podcasts that I could plug. Um, well, it depends, like, what kind of mood I'm in. Sometimes I want to do, you know, I was, of course, I love Terry Gross. I like all the NPRs. I love my Here and Now, which is the show that I'm on on NPR every week. I don't know. I love them all. Okay. We should do, like, a, uh, you should put that in our weekly newsletter, like the podcast you need to check out this week. Maybe we'll do that. You're listening to Jill on Money. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. And before we close out the first hour of the program, let's do uh, some business here. Let's ta- take some emails from you guys. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Um, here's an interesting question that we uh, got from Cindy, who writes, My husband and I are in our mid-50s. Neither of us will receive a pension. And here's the question. How much would we have to have in our savings in order for an annuity not to make sense? I don't really. So I'm trying to decipher that. If you mean how much do you need to have for an annuity to make sense? 
It's a different question. Um, if you mean most of the times, it do, it's probably not going to make sense. Um, it, it, I'm not sure how much money you have. There's no, there's no like bottom line. Here's how much you have. But I will say this: if you have less than a hundred thousand dollars that's saved up, you don't want to tie it up in an annuity. So if you have a small dollar amount relative to what your needs are, then we can't afford to put that in an annuity because you need your liquidity. You need to have access to your money. So I need more details, essentially. So, Cindy, right back. Give me more info. Will you, please? Pretty please? It would be great. Uh, Denny writes, I absolutely love your radio program. See, Mark, when I read it, it doesn't sound that good. If he said it, it would sound better. I was captivated by your recent review of the backdoor Roth IRA conversation. I want to know if I can continue to make monthly or annual contributions to the converted account once it is established. Ah, uh, no, you can't. You can't put new money in. In other words, it's a converted Roth IRA. I don't think you can contribute to that. And would you? Are you? Aren't you still? Are you still limited by how much you can put in in terms of your income level? You know what, Denny? I'm going to have to send you a little, let's do a little backdoor Roth. I have to get do more work with Denny. I need more information. Again, more information, please. All right. You're listening to Jill on Money. 855-411-JILL. And when we come back, we'll answer more of your questions. You can always send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Okie doke, it's hour number two. How very exciting. We are delighted that you are joining us for the second hour. Did you miss any part of the first hour? If you did, we'd love for you to check us out. Just go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and you can find what you missed. Maybe it was uh, the first hour and we got some great callers and questions. Maybe it was last week's show with the fabulous Amy Cuddy, the power of presence. You know, the woman who created the second most viewed TED Talk ever. Ah, God, I love these uh, amazing women who we've had on the show, and we're continuing our streak because we have such an awesome guest today. Annie Duke is her name, and she wrote a book that's called Thinking in Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. And why is this so important? Because Annie is a award-winning poker player. And there's a field where you don't have all the facts and you've got to make split decisions. So sit back and enjoy this wonderful interview with Annie Duke. Tell me one thing before we get started. You ready? Okay, I think. What is the best money decision you've made in your life? The best money decision I've made in my life. You know what's interesting about it? It's probably a decision that where I decided not to do something with my money. What's that? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. There's so many decisions that, you know, I never checked to see how they turned out. But I, I, I would bet that it's something that I didn't do with my money. Let's talk about those bets. You are um, a World Series of Poker champion. I am. Tell the story about how you started playing poker competitively first. Well, it's a little bit of a weird, windy story. Poker didn't get on TV till 2002. I started playing in the 90s, so you can imagine it would, for anybody, it would have to be a windy story, but particularly for a woman. So here's what happened. Um, I'm in graduate school at Penn. I'm studying cognitive psychology. I'm a National Science Foundation Fellowship. I'm moving along. I have my master's. I'm finishing my PhD work, and I'm going out onto the job market. And the job market in academics is seasonal, so you can only do it in the spring. And I had my uh, job talks lined up, and I got really sick, and I ended up in the hospital for two weeks. And I had to go recuperate. I kind of missed the market. So I had now had to wait a year. So what am I going to do, do during that year? Because 
you know, I don't have my fellowship now. I'm taking time off. Um, my brother, Howard Letterer, was, had been playing professionally for 10 years. He had been nice enough to, like, fly me out to Vegas for a vacation once in a while, and he'd give me, like, 50 bucks and tell me to go play small stakes poker. I was, like, saying to my brother, like, I don't know what to do. Like, now I have to wait a year. He said, why don't you play poker in the meantime? But so, wait, you guys grew up in a card-playing household? But not a poker-playing household, yes. But what a card-playing card? household. Like what? Hearts? Oh, gosh, we played hearts. Um, something called Oh Hell, which is a little bit of a stripped-down version of bridge. We mm -hmm. played um, a lot of gin. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was playing bridge with my dad Like by the time I was 14. I was his partner. So we, we did play a lot of cards. But poker was sort of my brother's milieu. He started playing when he was 18. So, yeah, so he, he said, you know, I think there's some poker games in Montana. You should do that in the meantime. And, you know, 20 years later was the meantime, I guess. I retired in 2012. So I, pl I played for 20 years, 18 of which were as a professional. So one of the things that's interesting about the way you start the book is you say that life is poker, not chess. And you start with a story about Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks. I remember watching that game. I remember that Pete Carroll made this call where he was going to throw a pass on second down. Was that right? And the commentators were going like like their heads were going to blow up. Like it was the biggest deal in the world. And there was an interception. And your point in telling that story is that it wasn't necessary. Everyone said, oh, my God, horrible decision. Worst play ever. Was it a bad decision? Well, it obviously it depends on who you read, but uh, when you look at the really deep mathematical analyses of it, one of the places you can go look is um, Benjamin Morris wrote about it on 538.com. You see that mathematically it looks like a pretty good decision. So you have the coach do something unexpected, which Car P. Carroll did. Everybody expected him to hand it off to Marshawn Lynch. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, you can read about it in the book or Benjamin Morris, for clock management reasons, for reasons of getting three plays instead of two, the pass actually looks really good, and the interception rate there is only 1%-ish. So it seems like relatively free to try for it. But, of course, it got intercepted, and they lost, and then it was you know the worst call in Super Bowl history. We tend to judge how good a decision something was based on what happened. And you say it has, that sometimes bad luck can occur or good luck can occur. So talk about the difference between a good decision and a bad decision versus the outcome. So resulting is taking the quality of the outcome and using that as the, as the sole way to derive the quality of the decision. It's really problematic because, look, how are we going to learn? We're going to take these outcomes that we have, the results that we have. You know, we generally are going to try to figure something out about whether the decision was good or not and then make adjustments to the way that we make decisions going forward. And if we stick these things together too tightly, we end up with all this kind of messed up analysis of the way that things worked out. So resulting is really bad. You write, decisions are bets on the future. They aren't right or wrong based on whether they turn out well on any particular iteration. An unwanted result doesn't make our decision wrong if we thought about the alternatives and the probabilities in advance and allocated our resources accordingly. Here is how I want to think about this. Look at the market. It's gone berserk. Berserk. Right? <laughs> berserk. Up, down, anywhere. Yeah. If somebody were to make the decision... Like, I got a million-dollar inheritance, everything's in the account, and said, okay, I've got to put my money to work, puts the money to work, and then has to endure selling on Friday and then on Monday, and then says, oh, my God, I made the worst decision of my life. Well, so hopefully that's not what they say. And I think that you see this all the time is that you react to these short-term fluctuations. So what I say about that is essentially this. If you think about, say, flipping a coin, if I flip a coin once and it lands heads and you've called heads, that doesn't tell me very much about your coin flipping ability because we only did it one time. I mean, four times doesn't tell me very much. 10,000 times, sure. But we're talking about one market fluctuation. And what you want to do is be more like thinking about what is the long-term trend of the market looks like. So, you know, in the book, I actually show this chart of Berkshire Hathaway. And I say, look, if you, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway over the long term, obviously it has this beautiful upward trend. But here's 11.30 on a Tuesday in 2008. It looks really bad. So we want to pull ourselves away from getting too caught up in these little tiny outcomes because it's just not enough data. Like It doesn't tell us anything that the market went down on one day. But I think what's fascinating is that 
in thinking in bets, you basically understand as a poker player that you've got to make disciplined decisions based on the information you have, but you have to recognize you're going to lose a bunch of hands, right? So there's there's two things that determine the way our lives turn out. One is the quality of our decisions. We should do a lot of focus on making sure that that's good. But the other is luck. And, and we don't have anything to do with luck. And there's a lot of it. We can think about something that seems like a really, really skillful decision that we can make. And I can show you how much luck intervenes. We'll get back to our interview with Annie Duke in just a minute. If you've got a financial question, don't wait. Just shoot us an email right now. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money, and if you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. You can uh, send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Follow us on Twitter at Jill on Money. Mark, have we reached the milestone? Finally. It feels like 15 years to get to 15,000. You know, there's a bunch of dopes out there. We've got like hundreds of thousands of followers. I got 15,000. Oh, Mark says maybe they buy them. I didn't realize that. That's right. That's Remember that New York Times article was really interesting. Anyway, uh, I digress. So um, one of the things that I've been really interested in ever since uh, we interviewed this neuropsychologist way back when. No, she was a neurologist, not a psychologist, neurologist. Um, she was a neuro-ophthalmologist, Me Too Steroni. Remember, Mark, when she said something to the effect of that, like, we are just very uncomfortable with uncertainty as investors or anything in life, that that's where the stressors really come out. And, um, and I think that we're equally as uncomfortable with the idea that because we don't control everything, there are certain elements that you want to think, oh, I'm in control, but there are always elements of luck. Like, oh, isn't it lucky someone knocks on my door door and offers me a bunch of money for my house, you know, three months before housing prices start to peak? Isn't that lucky? And how can we get comfortable with this concept of luck and how we can incorporate it in our lives? Well, our guest, Annie Duke, renowned World Series of Poker champion, is here to help us out. Here's more of our interview with Annie Duke. How can we help people who are listening um, be more comfortable with this element of, of luck? Because I think that this makes people feel really freaked out, that they want to believe. For example, people will say, I want to know what the market's doing. Well, you don't know what the market's doing. Like We interviewed this woman who's a neurologist who said, you got to see what happens to the brain when you, flo when you float uncertainty out there. It's wild. Like the brain goes completely yeah. nutty. We don't like uncertainty. So then we cling to this black and white universe. And as you said, you reinforce your own case. But investing in and of itself, playing poker, these are uncertain activities that we kind of know over the long term, generally speaking, will happen. But at any given time, it can blow up in your face. It can feel horrible. How do we make people more comfortable with that? The short story is to change what it is that makes you feel good. So, of course, uncertainty makes us feel bad. Finding out that something that you believed maybe isn't so accurate doesn't sort of naturally come to us. So what we need to do is figure out a way to change what it is that makes us feel good. So let me give you an example. I'm sure that you've heard this a lot from people, right? Some some horrible thing happens to them and they say, well, I just got unlucky. Mm -hmm. Some great things happen and they say, I'm, I'm so smart. A, I'm so smart. <laughs> right. That That's called self-serving bias, by the way. <laughs> You can see why. But this is a very natural way that we process the world. We like to onboard all the good stuff to skill, and then we like to sort of offload all the kind of bad stuff that happens to us to luck. Mm -hmm. Right? How am I processing my own outcomes? So that's obviously like a short-term hit, right? Like I'm getting a short-term like boost of endorphins and feel good and all of that. 
you notice that what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm not comfortable with this luck element, so I'm just going to shunt off all the bad stuff to that, mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to help me to sort of feel better. But what if we change what you reinforce me for? What if I change the rules of the game? And I say that, you know what? What would make me feel really bad is thinking that I'm blaming something on luck that I actually could use to inform my own decision making. And instead, what I want to do is be the best credit giver I can, be the best uh, mistake admitter that I can be. Well, so that's a really nice goal, hard to do on your own. Mm -hmm. So if you get other people to start reinforcing that behavior with you, then that's where you're really going to do well. Because in the end, we're all rats in a maze trying to get to the end of the maze and get our little piece of cheese. So ask other people to help you reinforce this stuff. Be the ones who are giving you that pellet. I want to hear a little bit about this group rewards because you're talking about that a little bit on, you know, kind of missing opportunities to examine your decisions and figure out where you do better. And for people who, who work in groups, there is a unique opportunity to do this. Let's say I'm a boss and I've got a group of people. I'm listening to this podcast. What can I do to either do a little postmortem or premortem about decision making with the group? So all groups aren't created equal. So we've all heard a lot about echo chambers. That's where groups tend to drift towards. So that's where you as an individual say, I want to confirm my own beliefs. Well, guess what? Groups do that too. Mm. So groups can sort of become this confirmatory thought style if they sort of run on their own without intentionality, right? So um, it's like, oh, we're great and our strategy is great and we're all so smart. And it sort of just becomes a bigger version of the individual. So as a leader, what you want to do is put in place this culture that encourages exploratory thought which means that you have to have this commitment to accuracy over being right. And you also have to be very, very tolerant of dissent. So people have to feel really, really comfortable in giving views that disagree with kind of the prevailing ideas in the room, particularly the ideas of the leader, because people want to feel like they're team players and it's kind of hard to disagree with the leader. Right. So how do you do that? Well, there's two really great things that you can do as a leader that you can um, include in your group in order to encourage dissenting opinions. And they both have to do with how are you defining what being a team player means. So everybody likes to be a team player. Let's go with that. So let's just change the rules of the game so that being a team player has to do with dissenting. Two great strategies. One is red team, blue team. So you have you know one team that's supposed to argue for the, the prevailing belief, idea, strategy, prediction, whatever it might be. And you have another group of people whose job is to do the best that they can at arguing against. So on that team, on the red team, being a team player is specifically dissenting, being hungry to try to figure out why not as opposed to why. Mm. So that's a great way to do it. The other you mentioned is called a premortem. So a premortem is when you imagine, okay, we, we've decided that we have some goal in mind. We want to increase earnings by X by this time period. And you imagine with the group, you've held up a newspaper and the headline is, we failed at our goal. We did not reach our earnings marks, right? So now what you do is with the group, you say, okay, everybody take out a piece of paper and write down the five reasons that we did not oh, that's reach, great. reach our goal. So again, you've changed the rules of the game, right? And what's really wonderful about that is that you end up with some crazy things that people wouldn't otherwise say in the room. So let's say you're a leader and you're, you're doing this and say, we, we missed our sales mark. Um, we missed our earnings, our earnings goals. Why? You'll get somebody who will literally write down on a piece of paper, you quit, for ah. example. Now, how are you going to get somebody to say that otherwise? So now, as a leader, you can say, that's great. Like, I quit. I died. I you know, right. got promoted out of this team. Let's not be surprised if that happens. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to, but let's not be surprised if that's happening. Let's figure out what are you going to do as a team if that happens. And now you can put these plans in place where you're no longer reactive to bad things that might happen, even very unexpected ones, and you become much more nimble and prepared. So the pre-mortem allows you to, you know, if you think about a painting, you have the positive space, right? That's mm -hmm. the rah, rah, let's think about why our plan will work. And then, but you wanna fill that out with the negative space. So change the rules of the game. I love that because it makes me feel like when I was uh, a practicing financial planner, that essentially, that's what a financial plan is. It is actually a pre-mortem. Mm -hmm. It is saying, what if every assumption you're making doesn't hold true? And I remember a client once saying to me, like, you're so cynical. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I'm not so cynical. But like, well, you're just talking about what if I got disabled? What if I were to die? What happens if instead of getting 8% return, I got 4% return? 
there's a sense that I have that 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 was really that was my job because you don't want to think that. So let me think that for you exactly. or let me at least open it up. Right. Right. So let's not get totally surprised and unprepared for if we get disabled or we don't get the return that we were expecting or the market goes down a thousand points in one day. Let's think about that in advance and have plans in place. So let me think about, well, you know, there are going to be days where the market crashes. So I'm going to decide in advance that on those days, I'm not going to react to it because one day doesn't really matter. I'm investing for the long term. So that would be an example of sort of preparing for the worst. Okay, we'll get back with Annie Duke in just a moment. Hey, during the break, why don't you just go out and buy her book? That's a good idea. Click buy thinking in bets by Annie Duke. You're listening to Jill on Money, and we will come right back with more of our interview. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. Are you the sort of person who just believes in whatever you believe in and that's it? I used to be that kind of person. And then I was I was learning how to become a trader my first boss had said to me, look, you know, it's really important to say like, well, what if I'm wrong? Because if you're wrong, then you lose a lot of money as a trader. That it, to me is a really important concept, whatever we're thinking about in our financial lives. And Annie Duke, our guest and author of Thinking in Bets, is here to help us understand the questions that are important to ask ourselves because we're not always right. These are Annie's questions. So here's more of our interview with Annie Duke. Uh, you have uh, some great questions. I just want to give, because uh, I love these questions, especially for people who have rock solid black and white beliefs, especially about their financial lives, because they think it's this concrete thing that is right. not about luck. And sometimes it often is. Well, it's very much about luck. Exactly. <laughs> Why might my belief not be true? What other evidence might be out there bearing on my belief? Are there similar areas I can look toward to gauge whether similar beliefs to mine are true? What sources of information could I have missed or minimized on the way to reaching my belief? What are the reasons someone else could have a different belief? What's their support? And why might they be right instead of me? What other perspectives are there as to why things turned out the way they did? And you say that basically just by asking these questions, you're going to move to a whole different plane. Yeah, so that that's actually – that list of questions is exactly what thinking in bets is about. So I think we've all had the experience of saying, you know, oh, I'm sure that that market is going to, you know, go up tomorrow because of blah, whatever it is, right? Whatever, plug in your reasons. And somebody says to you, oh, do you want to bet? And what happens is that you move off of shore into those questions that I, I list there, that it forces you to start thinking about, again, the world as uh, an accuracy game as opposed to a right game. Because the person who wins in a bet, once I challenge you to a bet, the person who wins in a bet is the person who has the most accurate view of the world, not the person who's just affirmed their prior. Right. Right. So... So once I've challenged you to bet, it makes you go through this whole vetting process of the beliefs that are informing the decision that you, you, you're about to make. And it makes you go through and think, well, why might I be wrong? What do they know that I don't know? All those things that it tells you that you're supposed to back off sure into, well, as opposed to I'm sure, the question should really be how sure am I? Because that really tells me how much I'm willing to risk on this. And what a beautiful thing to do because the fact is that that idea of I'm not sure is just a much more accurate representation of a world where, of course, there's hidden information. We don't have all the facts about anything. And there's luck in the way that the future unfolds. You can't be sure of anything about the way the future unfolds. And that's even when we know the math for sure. If I know that a coin is 50-50, I still don't know if it's going to flip heads or tails on the next one. So let's all be I'm not sure a lot more. I love that. Um, I, my first job, I was an options trader. And in the gold, silver, and copper options pits on the Commodities Exchange of New York. 
you know, so I know enough statistics to be dangerous, not probably as much as you. And um, I remember when I was clerking, we started getting our mm-hmm. training. We're running down the positions and we're looking at outcomes and we're looking at this Black Scholes model and what's the outcome and what's the likelihood and percentage of loss. And my boss, we, we sort of hand my boss like what we think where we are. And the boss looks at me and goes, you want to bet your job on this number right now? You're telling me I'm long six futures. Are you want to bet your job on that? And I stopped and, I, and he looked at me and goes, I'm serious. If this number's not right, you're going to be fired. I took the, the thing back. I ran it five more times. I came back and I said to myself, oh, crap, well, I'm as sure as I'm going to be. Yes. He's like, okay, I just want to make sure that you double check, triple check, because in the middle of a trading session, you, I need you to ask yourself that. Would I bet my job on this number? Yeah, so that, that's such a great story, by the way, and I, I would like to be able to borrow it. Because Anytime. It, it's such a good demonstration. What a bet does is it acts like an accountability mechanism for your beliefs. It, it forces you to be accountable to the things that you believe. And if you have, if we have a clash of beliefs, it acts like a referee for, okay, we disagree. So now we have this referee. So what I say in the book is obviously like, you know, outside of you're on the floor um, or you're at a poker table, we probably don't want to go around challenging our friends or colleagues to bets all the time. So the way we want to do it is through good group decision making. So we want to include in the group this accountability mechanism that you're going to be held accountable to the things that you believe. And if two people disagree, there's going to be somebody refereeing that, acting like a bet without actually making people put money on the table. I was just listening to Ezra Klein's podcast, and he had a guy on as his guest who said, you've been very critical of me, and that's why I wanted to invite you on my podcast. I think that's really hard to do. How do you manage finding those people and listening to the feedback and not getting dragged down into the mud? Let's say that you and I are equally well-informed on a topic, but we have opposite views. We know kind of by definition that the truth must lie somewhere in the middle, Assuming that there isn't some huge thing that you've missed or some huge thing that I've missed, which is why I'm saying like we're equally well informed on the topic. Right. So it has to do again with sort of changing what it is that you're getting value out of. So if you're excited when you hear somebody who you know is really smart make you think a little bit differently, if that's what gets you off, that is how you get there. It's saying, do I want to be living on 1130 on a Tuesday on that chart where that little downtick just makes me so sad that I can't play for the long run and get just that upward trend to how things go over my my life. Because we know if we become better decision makers as we go along, if we're if we're making good decisions as we go along, our, our lives have a very high probability of going pretty well. Right. They might not because luck can intervene. Absolutely. For sure. But we're increasing the probability that things are going to go pretty well for us. So that's what we want to do. We want to be thinking about the long term. What you recognize is that if that's the goal that I have, I must figure out how to calibrate my beliefs. I must figure out how to moderate my beliefs. And I can only do that by finding people who are super smart, who disagree with me, and listen to them. And I'm willing to take that kind of short term, ooh, that didn't feel good. Because I know that in the long run, it's going to make me so much better. Thank you so much to Annie Duke for joining us today. We'll have a link so you can buy her book, Thinking in Bets. Might make a fine present as you approach graduation season in a couple of months. So I love that. It's Jill on Money. And if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, head over to JillOnMoney.com. And you can see all the great curated stuff that Mark and I are compiling every week. Jill on Money will be right back. Have a finance question? There are many ways to reach the show. You can call anytime at 855-411-JILL, send an email to askjill at jillonmoney.com, or tweet a question on Twitter using the handle at jillonmoney. Just use the hashtag AskJill. You're back with Jill on Money, and we are plowing through some emails this segment, so let's get going. If you've got a question, just shoot us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Steve says that he and his wife currently have 800 grand in a rollover 401k, uh, I mean a rollover IRA with Fidelity, 
And they are choosing the managed services at Fidelity, eight-tenths of 1%, 0.8% a year. And he says, yeah, the returns have been okay, not great. And we also have $1.4 million with Edward Jones, a simple plan, a small Roth, a 401k. I am 60. My wife is 56. We own a small business. I hope to ease out of it in the next four to seven years. The business value is about seven fifty. Our current household income is approximately $200,000 before taxes. I'm wondering if I can do as well or better without the management fees. Listen, you can always do better. You can save yourself the money. Yeah, right? you're going to save yourself eight or nine grand a year. That goes right to your bottom line. But what he says is, I'm not actively involved in trade decisions. I'd rather leave it to the experts. Well, there's a, I mean, look, there's a couple of things. First of all, the Edward Jones, he says, offers a mix of American funds and some bond funds. There's no management or brokerage fees, but there are fees. You did pay to own those funds. Those are loaded mutual funds. So you probably paid something going in. Um, if you want, you could potentially just say to Fidelity, uh, you know, Keep the funds you have and get rid of the management fee. Maybe you don't need it managed. Maybe you just want to make a 50-50 portfolio and go to sleep at night. Sounds like you got plenty of money. You're doing well. Um, And then that's it. If you wanted to have someone actually actively manage it and pay a lower fee, you got two choices. One is um, you can go to Vanguard. You can move the Fidelity funds and go over to Vanguard for for three tenths of one percent, point three percent, they actually have personal advice and management. You can go to uh, the sponsor of our podcast, Betterment. They charge a quarter of a percent, point two five percent. Why don't you check those out and tell me what you think, and give us a holler back, okay? Thank you for writing, Steve. Bob says that. Uh, I know I've heard you say that in certain instances, it's a good idea to meet and speak with a fee-based financial planner. I believe my wife and I are at that point, and we don't want to just jump in with someone we don't know to get advice. Um, Here's my background. I have a defined benefit pension, and I'm eligible for it right now, 58 years old. He was a union electrician for 34 years, 2300 bucks a month. Another part of my union pension, $900 per month, is available in two years at 59 and a half. Um, he's got some insurance. He's got cash value. Um, if he works for in the union for five more years, all the values would go up. My wife has about a half a million dollars in her 401k. Um She's eligible at 65 years old. We may work another couple of years. I may start my union pension. We're looking for you to suggest three fee-based financial planners in the Middlesex County area in Connecticut. Mm, I don't know if I can do that, but I can interview. I, I'll tell you what, Mark, send me this guy's email address and I can send him. I, I mean, forgetting about that you need someone in that exact area. Um I think that uh, I can send you some fee-based planners, and then you can do what you want with it. It's very interesting. Uh, so let's see. I think that would be it. I think that's – I'll send you some advisors. You can also go to NAPFA, National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, NAPFA.org. Put in your zip code and see if uh, what comes up. But I'll get you some names. Okay. He listens to us on the radio on WTIC in Hartford. Love that. Okay. How much time do I, can I possibly, let me do this quickly from uh, Joe who wants to know about um, a construction condo. Here we are, another construction condo. Um, Okay. I'm just looking quickly. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I can do this question as quickly as I thought I did. Okay. They want to sell their current home in New Jersey over the next couple of years. Use the money from that to pay off a condo. He's 63. Wife is 62. Um, plenty of pension money, hundred grand a year, $2.8 million in IRAs. We still need to borrow about three hundred grand for the purchase. Considering we tend to intend to pay off the mortgage in a year or two, 
Um, does it make sense to spend $7,000 in mortgage costs or simply take the additional $300,000 in distributions and jump into the 35% tax bracket? I think take the mortgage because why pay the taxes? I mean, you already have to pay. Just keep your keep the distributions as low as possible and then use the proceeds from the house and pay off that mortgage. I think that's going to be your better bet. So take the mortgage. Try to work with the mortgage brokers and whittle down the pricing of it. But, yeah, I think and it also gives you a little bit more in terms of options going forward. So I would take a mortgage, even if it's for the short term. I hate get taking that taxable income. I hate you going up into an extra tax bracket. So just uh, just do that. OK, good. You're listening to Jill on Money. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and subscribe to our newsletter so I can win my bet with Mark. All righty. Jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we would love to hear from you. So great. All you have to do is send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. So uh, Teresa has got two questions. Um, Here's number one. My son, a starving artist, a sculptor to be specific, does contract work for toy companies he made about fifty grand last year, taxable income of around $35,000, but paid $10,000 because he has to pay both the employer, employer, employee and employer portions of Social Security and Medicare. Is there something he can do, form an LLC or something, to lower his taxes? No. That's the deal with f- having an LLC. The thing he could do is try to defray the those amounts by making a pre-tax contribution so that the income earned is lower. But yeah, that's the deal. You got to pay both sides. It's a drag. Here's Teresa's second question. Uh, by, and by the way, if he were to have an LLC or an S Corp, doesn't matter. You're still, this is still the exact same thing. You have a different structure, but you would still have to pay both sides. Uh, second question. I work at a school district does, which does not offer a Roth type of 403b um i've heard about the back end roth is that something i can do backdoor roth um yeah i mean presumably if you have money to put away you can put it into a traditional ira if you make too much money okay if you make more than a hundred thirty five thousand dollars yourself or married 199 or less um if you make less than that amount, then you can just make a Roth contribution. If you make more than that, then you can make a contribution into a non-deductible IRA and then immediately go ahead and convert it. So hope one good piece of news, one not so good piece of news for you, Teresa. Thanks for writing. Okay, that's it. That is the show. Thank you so much for joining us. It's just been great. Love love hearing from you and continue to love hearing from you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. If you missed any portion of the show, just go to JillOnMoney.com and you can find old shows, read stuff we've uh, written, and watch some of my appearances on CBS News. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Mark, the best producer in the world. We'll see you next week. <laughs> 